tudom, hogy mennyien. Azt szeretném kérni, hogy egy pillanatra, aki itt van, az villancsa föl a képét, hogy lássuk, hogy, hogy összegyűjtünk-e. Please, if somebody is here, show his face for a minute. Yes, I think uh, there are several colleagues here. So I think uh, uh, now we can we can start the fourth session of, of this conference. Um, uh, I am not sure um, uh, is it your first or second or fourth uh, uh, occasion when you step uh, step into this uh, conference. Uh, we uh, planned a four session um, uh, uh, for this conference, and I am Peter Tibor uh, Neji, and I am asked to be the um, organizer of the fourth uh, session. Uh, uh, there are uh, in this conference two sessions, uh, which are English language uh, uh, ones. In this uh, uh, session, uh, 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 there will be five uh, uh, lecturers. Uh, uh, three of them are uh, Hungarian, but uh, in this uh, session, all uh, all participants will speak in English. And I would like to ask uh, our audience uh, speak English uh, too. Um, the um, our first uh, lecturer, uh, Martin Perebu, uh, he his uh, um, uh, uh, institutional background is Salisbury uh, uh, University, and he uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, some uh, interesting uh, books which uh, belongs to uh, our topics. Uh, he uh, was uh, he, he wrote book. Uh, about the uh, uh, post-war, uh, I mean post-First uh, World War uh, uh, situation uh, in West Europe, and uh, he wrote um, a, a book uh, about the relation of history and film. But his um, contemporary lecture uh, will belong uh, to the um, history of Netherlands. Uh, we have to stress that uh, if somebody was not here in the in the um, uh, yesterday in the uh, in the morning hours, I mean Central European morning hours uh, yesterday, uh, that uh, Martin uh, is uh, one of the coordinator or um, or one of the the. Uh, host of this uh, uh, conference, so uh, I would like to ask Martin uh, uh, start um, uh, his lecture. Uh, please try to keep um, um, uh, the twenty minutes. So uh, please start. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you from Salisbury, Maryland, USA this morning. So uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on how you look at it. Um, so my talk this morning or afternoon is uh, focused on the Netherlands. And uh, you might guess from the name uh, that uh, that is my ethnicity. Both of my parents were Dutch. Uh, my mother is still living. And um, so that story weaves into the general story. So, so my purpose this morning is really to kind of share the broad outline of the Dutch experience in the last year of the war. And uh, to do that in part by sharing some of my own story. And I'm going to do that by um, sharing with you, if I might. Can you see that? Yes, uh, we yes. see um, family from Upper Dawn picture. Yes. Okay, good. And uh, is that, are you seeing part the, the, the slides on the left or do you just see the picture? Uh, we see the slides on the left and we, we see the picture, the big picture too. Okay, okay, good. Um, all right, well, that, that should work okay. I'm going to 
All right. So I, I do this in part, I show this slide to my students and they ask if the gentleman on the right is me. <laughs> um, <it's> like, no, <laughs> that is my grandfather on my mother's side. So my mother's uh, family name was Van Appeldorn. And that is my mother that is the third from the left. She was uh, nine years old in 1938. And uh, so insofar as, and I'm, I'm trying, of course, trying to keep my remarks uh, to the 20 minutes this morning. So I'm not going to bring in my father's family too much, but uh, do want to talk a little bit more about my mother's family. My mother is still living. And so uh, she is a source for my presentation this morning. And so uh, far as she uh, remembers uh, these events, of course, she was, uh, the, her 11th birthday was the day that the Dutch surrendered to the Germans in 1940. And she remembers that her parents cried on that day. And uh, so in this picture, we see her in the middle on the far left, my Tante Duerche, uh, who is the oldest in the family next to her, Hermann, uh, my, the, the only son, the only brother in the family, then my mother, my, my Oma, and then my Tante Han, who is also still living, is between her parents. And that is my um, grandfather on the far right, Jan Peter van Appeldoorn. And so um, they come into this story. So again, this is uh, to talk about the experience from their perspective and more broadly the civilian perspective in the Netherlands during the last year of the war, certainly the hardest year for, for most Dutch people, um, of course, with the important exception of uh, the Jewish population of the Netherlands, which in 1940 was about 140,000. And over the course of the occupation to the, that point, uh, most of them had been uh, deported and murdered uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, some, of course, uh, died in, in the Netherlands as well, but by far the, uh, the majority of, of the victims of the Holocaust were, were uh, deported to the uh, specially set up killing centers in Eastern Europe, especially uh, Auschwitz and Sobibor. So by uh, the last year of the war, which we're going to define as starting around the time of Operation Market Garden, uh, most of the Jewish uh, victims of the Holocaust were already dead. Uh, but I will note, of course, the very famous exception to that, or a very famous exception to that, the Frank family, of course, Anne Frank of the, of the uh, celebrated world-renowned diary. Uh, they were betrayed in August of 1944, so right around that same time, just a month earlier, and their ordeal of deportation uh, was getting underway in the fall of 1944. And uh, their mother was the first of the family to die in January of 1945, and Margot and Anne died the following month at uh, Bergen-Belsen. Uh, and I'll note that Anne uh, was uh, just a month younger than my mother. So when you see that picture of my, uh, my grandparents and, and their family in 1938, uh, you can imagine that uh, Anne Frank's experience in the Netherlands would have been somewhat similar. And uh, my grandfather was a businessman, as was Otto Frank. Uh, they, were, they were fairly well-to-do. And um, so there's sort of a parallelism there. But turning to the experience of the Dutch people more broadly in 1944-1945, uh, of course, we start with the um, uh, Allied advance, of which the Dutch were well aware. Of course, they could listen to uh, Radio Oranje or Radio Orange, uh, weekly broadcasts of 15 minutes on the BBC European service uh, that uh, gave them updates on the progress of the Allies after the D-Day landings in June of 1944. Uh, and of course, those were uh, successful and uh, re resulted in the rapid, relatively rapid liberation of France and Belgium. And uh, so there was some reason to expect that the um, uh, that progress would continue. But of course, the reality was that by September of 1944, the uh, Allies were overextended in terms of supply lines and needed to uh, liberate additional North Sea ports uh, to to sustain the operations that would be needed to liberate Western Europe. So just to give you a quick uh, geographical orientation, uh, the Western part of the country is the most densely populated. The largest cities are there, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, uh, Leiden and Harlem, slightly smaller, Utrecht. Uh, those, that's really the most densely populated country part of the most densely populated country in Europe, uh, even today. My, my parents both grew up in Gelderland, which is more in the center, so they were quite close to Arnhem. Um, my mother's family name, of course, Van Appeldoorn, and here to the town where she grew up is just north of Appeldoorn. My father was from Ada, which is right around here, right, pretty much the dead center of the country. So, um, 
Operation Market Garden, of course, was a massive disappointment, uh, resulted in the liberation of the, or to that point, the southern part of the country had been liberated, but the crossing of the Rhine proved to be that bridge too far. A famous book by Cornelius Ryan, a journalist who wrote several bestsellers about um, uh, the Second World War and chapters of it. Um, immediately prior to that, and again, fueled by that sort of sense of momentum and optimism, uh, fueled by uh, Allied advances to that point, uh, the Dutch, uh, in some ways triggered by the prime minister in exile in London, uh, Peter Gerbrandi, um, uh, undertook sort of a premature celebration, as it turns out, Dola Dinsdag, which is kind of crazy or mad Tuesday, uh, September 5th, 1944, uh, which for, for many Dutch was a day of jubilation. Uh, but for the members of the national, uh, the Dutch National Socialist Party, it was a day of panic. Uh, the Dutch National Socialist Party at its height numbered probably about 200,000 people. And of course, they had uh, installed themselves in various positions of power throughout the country as collaborators. Uh, and then in September of 1944, uh, again, with Dola Dinsdag, they kind of fled uh, in the direction of Germany. And with the irony that uh, some of them collected at... Um, Westerbork, which of course was a transit camp that had been uh, deployed and used uh, in as part of the, the final solution and the mass murder of uh, the Netherlands Jewish population. Uh, as we know, of course, Operation Market Garden in September of 1944 failed. Uh, the Allies were overextended. It was really uh, not in the cards for them to succeed. And so the scholarly consensus on that is that um, it was indeed the bridge too far and sort of doomed to failure. Uh, Bernard Montgomery's hubris is, is often cited. He wanted to be the one to, to secure the great Allied victory there, um, but it was not to be. And of course, that meant that the Dutch were now in for a winter of uh, the, the most difficult winter of the war, where the occupation to that point for, for most Dutch had been, um, I don't want to say benign because Nazi occupation is never benign, uh, but in terms of hardship and physical hardship, uh, the, 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 the worst was yet to come in the, this upcoming winter. Very important in all of this is uh, sort of the, the questions of collaboration and resistance. And, and while the Dutch uh, bureaucracy and uh, key services and industries were, were very much deployed in carrying out the Holocaust, the, the, the great crime at the center of the, of the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. The, the, the leadership uh, took to London and, and fled so that you didn't have a regime that was comparable in nature to what you had in France with um, Pierre Laval and... Um, and Marshal Pétain. Uh, rather, you had uh, Queen Wilhelmina, who was uh, a Dutch Protestant, and both my parents' families were, were of that sort of same reformed Calvinist um, tradition. Uh, Queen Wilhelmina was, was fierce in her anti-Nazism. And so, you know, growing up with all of this lore and being a historian, you're always kind of digging a little bit to see, was it really that way? And, and was that, um, was that anti-Nazism countrywide uh, as, as fierce as it was. And certainly Queen Wilhelmina was a very important figure in that sense. Uh, world renowned as the richest woman in the world, the, world, the first billionaire uh, woman in the world. So she had kind of an international reputation. Uh, Winston Churchill was, was said to have feared no man more than Queen Wilhelmina. So she was certainly a very formidable character. And uh, while a constitutional monarch and respectful of the, uh, of the, the constitutional constraints on her power, uh, nonetheless uh, did exercise that power that she did have uh, on key occasions. For example, when Prime Minister de Geer showed signs in 1940 of returning from London to um, the Netherlands to set up a uh, collaborationist government, she kind of put the kibosh on that, as we say in, in English. She, she basically uh, vetoed that, let's say, and Peter Gerbrandi became the Prime Minister and remained in that role despite the fact that there was some, some turmoil within that government 
over the course of the war. Uh, on a certain occasion, that government fell, but Peter Hebron deformed the next government. So, uh, and that, that was important in terms of the internal politics. You see a similar dynamic as um, in France, where there was a certain weariness of uh, the Third Republic and sort of the parliamentary sort of lassitude or ineffectiveness, and the hope uh, from some that there would be sort of a, a stronger, more authoritarian, if you will, uh, hand uh, constitutionally and otherwise at the end of the war. Uh, the Dutch would return to their parliamentary ways, as of course would the French. Um, and Gerbrandi is again, sort of a very important figure and very much had the confidence of uh, Winston Churchill. So played a very important role in terms of advocating Dutch interests in London during the war. Uh, that all gets very tangled and complicated. And so maybe I will leave that in the interest of time to uh, move on. Um, so following the failure of Operation Market Garden, so you have the, the Dutch population as a whole cognizant of the fact that the Allied invasion will come and that the uh, Allies ultimately will triumph. Um, and in conjunction with that, undertook an act of resistance at considerable cost to the Dutch civilian population. Uh, the rail strike uh, starting in September of 1944 played a, a critical role, of course, in, in starting the, the hunger winter, uh, the, the, the phenomenon that gave the last year of the war its name for all intents and purposes. Uh, as you can see from this image here, there was some uh, pushback on that uh, in terms of the propaganda suggesting that these acts of resistance would only result in pain and suffering for the Dutch people. And while it did result in pain and suffering for the Dutch people, uh, they were willing to make that sacrifice in the interest of uh, forwarding the Allied victory. And one of the main uh, reasons for undertaking the rail strike was, again, at the behest of the Allies, uh, trying to stop uh, the Germans from installing and launching uh, rockets uh, in the westernmost Netherlands against England. This is the era of the V1 and the V2 rockets and rocket attacks that once again uh, expose uh, the uh, English population to bombardment uh, in the late stages of the war. So that is one of the main um, strategic military reasons for the strike. But of course, it had enormous consequences in terms of uh, the economy and the distribution of resources in the Netherlands, resulting in the hunger winter, which is, uh, again, the name that if you're going to use a subtitle to describe the Dutch experience in the last year of the war, that is the most commonly invoked. Uh, it affected the western part of the country primarily, uh, the north and the east, and again, that's the, the north and the east, still under occupation, was far more agricultural and really did not experience any significant food shortages. And in fact, uh, it's really the, the, the famine is concentrated in the western part of the country. Uh, in the cities, of course, food production, uh, not a significant element in, in urban life. There's some farmland around the cities, but clearly not enough to, um, to support uh, that very, very uh, heavily urbanized population and its food needs. Um, so the, the phenomenon uh, evolved of the Eitenhalers, which is a Dutch word for basically food, um, people who pick up food, people who sort of gather food. People would come from the West by whatever means they could, by bicycle or with a, with a stroller, perambulator, what, what have you, some means of getting food. And uh, while these stories are, are often not particularly inspiring as far as uh, the farmers who had the food, uh, not willing to let it go for for you know, black, less than black market prices. Um, so those aren't are exactly heartwarming stories. But my mother remembers. So my mother, my, my mother's family was quite prosperous. My, my grandfather owned a soap factory in a small town. Soap, of course, a critical uh, good. Uh, business was good during the war. Um, the Dutch population, again, the, the, the Nazis hoped to sort of cultivate the Dutch as kind of almost as good as them uh, in terms of their racial hierarchy of things. Um, and so I, I, I don't know for a fact, but I imagine that most of that soap was distributed within the Netherlands during the war, probably more towards the end of the war. Those resources would have been sucked more in the direction of Germany. Um, but that's that's the way it was. And my my grandparents were were quite affluent. And during this period, my grandmother would would organize. They would kind of network and organize uh, uh 
the opportunity for people to come from the cities in the West to stay at their house. They had a big house um, to uh, have a meal that first night to go in search of food the next day and sort of gather up what they could stay another night with another meal and be sent on their way. Um, so my mother remembers their house being a very busy, busy place during this time as uh, her family kind of did what they could to alleviate the increasing suffering uh, that was um, uh, affecting the Western part of the country in particular. The phenomenon of flooding uh, was, and this is something that I would be interested to research more extensively because it's really the threat, I would argue, that's kind of my preliminary thesis here, the threat of flooding and the, and the vulnerability of the Netherlands to flooding given the extensive system of dikes and polders, uh, reclaimed land, uh, the overall, uh, of course, low elevation of the land, uh, of course, very much an issue today with climate change. Uh, but at that time, the threat that this land could be inundated, of course, taking farmland out of production and, and threatening the population in other ways, um, turned out to be not the disaster that it could have been. Um, and, and this also illustrates uh, quite nicely, I think, the dilemmas of continued occupation. So the threat that the Germans, just out of a spirit of, of bloody mindedness um, or vengeance, and indeed under orders from Berlin at a certain point to sort of pursue that scorched earth devastation of lands that they were going to be forced to, uh, to evacuate, to, to cease occupying. Um, so that was one threat. But of course, the, the Allies also uh, needed to win the war and uh, in, in the Netherlands becoming a war zone, expose civilian population to those perils as well. So we have kind of twin um, floodings that occur during this time period. In the fall, the Allies flood uh, Walcheren, which is an island sort of the bottom uh, left, if you're looking at the map in Zeeland, that was deemed to be vital to uh, winning the Battle of the Scheldt, which would make uh, Arn or sorry Antwerp um, uh, the port of Antwerp available to the Allies to bring in supplies. So again, absolutely necessary to end the war. But the flooding of the Walcheren, in fact, resulted in civilians drowning uh, because of the element of secrecy uh, and, and uh, the importance of surprise. Uh, they all did not go according to plan, and there were several fatalities involved there. Whereas the Germans uh, it flooded uh, the Wieringer Meer uh, late April of 1945, so really for no good reason other than to be sort of bloody minded about it, but it did at least give the civilian population um, uh, adequate warning so that there were no fatalities associated with that flooding. Again, not to give the occupying Nazis any humanitarian awards here. Uh, they did recognize, and even someone like Arthur Zeiss Inkvart, who was the head of state, if you will, of the occupied Netherlands, the Austrian who'd briefly headed uh, Austria uh, at the time of its uh, incorporation into the Third Reich in 1938, uh, was in charge in the Netherlands. And again, not anyone, not a candidate for any human rights uh, awards here, in fact, would be executed um, following his conviction at the Nuremberg trials in 1946. But um, yeah, I guess it does have to be said in fairness that he did not carry out those wider scorched earth directives from Hitler and, and Berlin more broadly. Uh, so the flooding uh, element of the widespread disaster that was feared did not in fact come to pass. And in the broader context of that, uh, this is the um, liberation of the North uh, East. So you see Arnhem, um, Here's Nijmegen, which, which, which had been liberated in the fall. Here is the, the Wall River. Here's the Rhine River. And here is Arnhem. And again, my, my mother was, uh, Ada is where my father was from. My mother is from uh, north of uh, Appledorn. So there, this is all very close to them. Uh, but the final liberation of the Netherlands, this campaign begins in late March. Uh, Arnhem is completely devastated in this campaign. Um, they, the Allies actually come in from the east. Uh, and the city is completely flattened. My mother remembers uh, people um, sort of harboring, taking refuge in her hometown, you know, wherever they could. She remembers that she came on, that they came on foot, uh, but their homes were completely devastated. Really, uh, Arnhem is the probably the most heavily damaged Dutch city uh, of the Second World War, probably rivaled only by Rotterdam at the beginning of the war, with of course the infamous bombing of Rotterdam in May of 1940. 
coast. So uh, this resulted, of course, in the uh, the liberation of the north and the east, uh, leaving just Fortress Holland. Uh, so the, those western cities that I mentioned earlier, uh, those at the end of by the end of April were the only part of the Netherlands that had not been liberated, and in fact, they would not be. Um, there would be not. There wouldn't be a battle for the fortress Netherlands. That was uh, something that was determined by the overall outcome of the war and the German surrender in early May. So the the Germans would simply have to evacuate, as opposed to being uh, defeated there. In that context, um, so I, my my mother's family is from north of Appledorn, as you saw on the last uh, map. Um, my uh, oh, my uncle uh, Herman, who was never really my uncle, of course, but um, he fought in the resistance and the resistance was organized to assist the allies. They wanted to participate in the liberation of their homeland. And uh, my uncle, as a young man of 22 years, uh, was participating in the resistance. And on the 13th of April, he and a group of uh, fellow resistance fighters were hiding near a bridge uh, on the Appledorn Canal, hoping to receive the Canadians uh, who were uh, marching through the area and were the, the armed forces that were responsible for, for much of this liberation uh, activity. Um, however, there had been a change of plans. Those plans had not been communicated. Uh, the Germans found out where they were. Uh, they were, in fact, wearing uniforms that identified them as uh, resistance fighters. And in attempting to flee upon their discovery, uh, a number of them were shot, including uh, Hermann, and uh, others were rounded up and shot against a wall uh, on a, in a nearby home. Uh, this is known as the, the Clement Bruch uh, drama or, or um, disaster. 13 people were killed uh, in this incident, and as you'll note from the date of April 13th, 1945, just days before the end of the war, with, of course, life-changing uh, consequences for, um, for all the individuals concerned. And so the Sorry, uh, you are at the end of your time. Okay. Can I say just a concluding statement? I have one one final yes, naturally, naturally, yes. All right, all right. So so the, the, the liberation of the Netherlands was bittersweet. Um the hunger winter had claimed 22,000 victims, and so the scenes of jubilation don't tell the whole story. Many were too weak to get up out of their beds to um to greet their liberators. And again, for those who had experienced the, um, uh, the, 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 the war up close and personal, uh, this I'll just say in conclusion. So I visited the Netherlands in 2017 and visited the soap factory that had been my grandfather's and saw a plaque there that no one seemed to be aware of uh, in memory of uh, Hermann van Appeldoorn, who was expected to take over his father's business. Um, and so in honor and memory of what they called our future, our future director, our future boss, um, who was killed uh, in the last days of the war. And of course, being the good uh uh, Protestant uh, that they were, quote uh, from Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. And I had never seen this before. I had never heard about this before. And there I was, you know, at the age of 55, about the age that my grandfather was at the time that he lost his son, who was the age of my older son. So I have my, my wife and my two uh, children with me on that visit. And so Hermann was 22 years old, the same age that uh, my, my older son was at the time. So all the more uh, important to underscore, while we do important archival fact-based archival research, never to forget the, the personal connections and the impact of these dramatic events on people's lives. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now, uh, that's the period when we hope there will be some question from the audience. Please don't hesitate to say anything without any sign because nobody... How is um, I, ha I have a question, it's Daniela. Yes. Uh, so thank you for this fascinating presentation. And uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, if you can talk a little about uh, being a, a historian that research his own family. If 
you can say something about that. Do you see any benefits in it or, um, or anything? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, that's not, it's not something that I have done directly before. This is actually really the first time that I've talked as part of a scholarly presentation about this story. Um, and it's, uh, but, and yet I would say that, that the, one of the reasons why I'm a historian is because of these events, that these events very much were a presence. Um, even, you know, as a, as a child, uh, being aware of the war to the degree that, you know, a child can be aware of historical events uh, and the impact in the impact of that on 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 the family. Uh, Wary at the very same time, of course, of of the uh, the questions of objectivity, and um, and so while I'm trained as a historian, trained by the best, I got my PhD from from Yale University, and so I I, I learned and embraced the uh, the benefits of multi archival research, fact based research. Um, see also an opportunity here, and I guess I would say I'm in a later stage of my career, to, um, to, to re-embrace the, the things that um, inform our passion for history and the importance of history uh, and the importance of connecting, uh, especially a massive event like the Second World War, which can easily overwhelm us with, with the statistics. right? And even in the case of the Netherlands, where 22,000 people starved to death, which is a lot of people compared to one person, and yet minor in comparison to uh, the famines that, that affected uh, Bengal in India or Henan province in China, where millions of people died. Um, so, of course, the Second World War often confronts us with, with atrocities and, and catastrophes on a massive scale. And yet every, every death, every single death affected people in an important way. And so I think it's, it's, it's appropriate and... Um, uh, important to weave those elements of personal narrative in as 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 occasions warrant. But thanks for your question. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other question? If nobody else, I would um, like to ask something which is not directly to your lecture, but directly to the uh, question of Holland. That's uh, Netherlands, I mean. That, uh, uh, as I know, traditionally, this society is described as a, a pillar society, the pillarization of the society. And because the religion is one of the uh, basic elements of the, of the pillarization, I I would think that from the basis of this pillarization, it's uh, uh, somehow in uh, in a, a kind of link between the pillars and the level of collaboration. Is it true or not? Could you could you describe uh, something uh, about um, the the social and and the political and other groups of Netherlands, how their relations to the to the collaboration or uh, anti-Nazi anti -Nazi activities? Yes, well, that's a very good question, um, of course, and a really important one. Um, and, and in reflecting on this, and again, this kind of goes back to the last question, sort of wrestling with this, did, did did our family? I have an uncle. Was my my father's old their oldest sister was married to a, a Rotterdam policeman, so, and I don't really know the story, but but it must have been if he was active in in Rotterdam's police force, he must have played a role in the roundup of of Jews uh, in in Rotterdam in 1942 and and following, um, and so the it, it, I think it's certainly very important to cite the, uh, the, the, the religious factor in terms of the organization of Dutch society. I would say that somewhat in parallel to Germany, uh, the, the church institutionally failed um, 
in its greatest test because presumably uh, the, the the persecution and and mass murder. I'm using I don't want to use the word genocide because you know historically it was evolving at the time, but of course that's what we certainly would call it now. Um, failed, right? That the the the, the church. And uh, the Roman Catholic, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church or, or the Protestant um, church, churches in the Netherlands, uh, failed institutionally to, um, to, to put up uh, effective resistance to what the Nazi program was uh, in terms of the Holocaust in the Netherlands. And so I guess that kind of leads to the point that, that while there are those pillars and they are important, uh, in the end, decisions to do uh, to carry out acts of resistance certainly uh, required sort of an individual, it was a matter of individual conscience, certainly informed by the institutional church, but not organized, uh, broadly speaking, by the institutional church. And so, uh, again, you can look at Queen Wilhelmina and say there was a sort of a stalwart, good, devout Christian, pious Christian woman, and her example was certainly very important. But in terms of the, the organization of society and the potential of institutions to uh, resist where uh, a, a matter of, of fundamental human rights was, 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 was broached, um, that, that, that is the big disappointment. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. May I, uh, may I ask my question a little sharper? That mm -hmm. uh, if we see the East European um, uh, churches, they are, they were uh, we wouldn't say that it they don't uh, support the um, uh, anti-Nazi movement, but we have to say that they support the Nazism in several ways. Uh, practically uh, almost every anti-Semitic action, except the the real Holocaust was supported by the churches. What was the relation in that meaning? So, so the anti-Semitism or the uh, Christian anti-Semitism was a was a real uh, a problem in the pre-war Netherlands, or uh, or in that meaning in that time it was a. Um, less anti-Semitic tradition in, in, that, in that churches? I would say, sort of le less, uh, so, so sounding like an apologist for the Netherlands, but I do think that you can make a strong case that um, the Netherlands, which had granted uh, civil liberties to its Jewish population since the late, um, uh, since the early 19th century, late 18th century, um, did have a tradition of, of if you will, tolerance, um, and that there was, I would say, in marked contrast to, because of course in Germany you see the Lutheran Church completely, completely uh, co-opted by, uh, and I don't want to say co-opted because it sounds more passive than it was, uh, in terms of uh, sort of ab adopting the Nazi agenda. That is not the case, I would say, for the, the Protestant churches in the Netherlands by and large. While I think they're... they're um, their failings in the face of, of the trial of the Holocaust um, were more sins of omission than commission. They did not uh, embrace Nazi ideology. Um, and again, Wilhelmina would have been a, a good example of that and an important leader in that respect. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Is it, excuse me. Yes, I, I have one uh, question. But uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Perenbaum about those uh, Dutch uh, citizens who, who joined the, the German SS. Uh, what happened to them after the war? And uh, what is their place in the, in the memory of, of, of Holland during the Second World War? Yeah, um, so don't have a super specific answer to you, but certainly in terms of the memory uh, seen as traitors, you know, Anton Mussert, who is not, uh, who was the head of the Dutch Nazi party, was executed um, in, in uh, May of 1946. Uh, the, the young men who, saw, and I have a number here, who signed up for the, um, for the SS uh, they were, they were, of course, as, as often happened, um, so 20 to 25,000 Dutch men joined the Waffen-SS. 
And of course, a number of them would have been, a significant number of them would have been killed. They were, you know, sent off on uh, fool's errands, if you will, from a military standpoint, certainly towards the end of the war. Um, but, but definitely uh, pilloried at the end of the war and, uh, and seen as traitors. Um, uh, people who had belonged to the Nazi party, uh, in fact, again, from my, I, from my father's home, we have a painting by a, a Dutch painter who was pretty celebrated in the 20s and 30s. Uh, but who joined the 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 NS the the Nazi Party, and again, that's the different from the SS uh, specifically. Uh, but spent time in prison at the end of the war, so people were imprisoned for having served or having joined the Nazi Party. So it's definitely a, a kind of a um, a purge at the end of the war. And um, again, the numbers were such that I think you didn't face those same kind of dilemmas that 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 within Germany, for example. Uh, you'd have to kind of rehabilitate people who, you know, on the face of it, were, were guilty of some pretty egregious crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we move yes, to thank another you. lecture? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Okay. Now, uh, now uh, our next presenter... Uh, Lena T. Andras, are you here? Andras? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello. He, Can you hear me? Uh, his institutional background uh, is University of Szeged. Uh, he is a uh, Hispanist, uh, if I can say this word, Hispanist. Yeah. And as Hispanist, yeah. he, he is interested in generally the 20th century history, international relations, and uh, uh, he is uh, especially interested in the cinema of Spain uh, and uh, Latin America. So uh, it's your flow. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me and see me perfectly? Absolutely clear. Great, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this prestigious uh, congress. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, when we talk about the, the Second World War, we usually exclude uh, Spain as the most important players in this war, like in all wars, were the, the belligerent countries. But the role of this Iberian country should also be examined in order to be able to, to formulate a complex image on the war's international context. One of the antecedents of the Second World War was the Spanish Civil War, fought between uh, 1936 and 1939 uh, between the elected leftist Republican government and the, the insurgent, basically far-right nationalist military groups. Although it was a, it was a kind of national war, the civil war, um, and as the Spaniards call it a fratricidal war, but it also had international implications. Um, what is the most important from our perspective now, that Germany and Italy supported the nationalist insurgents because um, Hitler and Mussolini regarded Franco as a future collaborator in their international plans. One of the well-known consequences of the German and Italian aid in the Spanish Civil War was the bombing of the Basque town, uh, Guernica, in 1937 painted, for example, by Pablo Picasso as well. Uh, it may seem natural uh, that some years later, Hitler expected a kind of compensation from General Francisco Franco. Franco, um, who governed a nation in ruins and with clashes between his armed forces and the guerrillas, had three options during the Second World War, or uh, better to say that in the beginning of the um, Second World War. One, or the first, to position himself as an enemy of Germany and Italy, which he obviously did not want to do. Nor could he position himself as an enemy of the, of the Allied 
forces or allied powers as they had a powerful fleet uh, that could impose a blockade and worsen the situation uh, of Spain. So Franco had no choice but to opt for neutrality. The same position that Spain had maintained uh, in the First World War. However, uh, after Italy's entry to the war on the, uh, or in uh, 1940, Franco changed, uh, changed his position from neutrality to one of non-belligerence. In October uh, 1940, Franco met um, Hitler in France in order to resolve the disagreements why Spain was unwilling to enter the war on the side of the Axis powers. Spain finally did not enter the war as a belligerent country, uh, although it still remains vague uh, whether this happened because Hitler did not want to fulfill the territorial demands made by Franco as a, as a requirement to enter the war, or if Franco uh, raised his request to an excessive level to discourage Germany and thus, um, thus achieve uh, the country's neutrality. It is believed that um, if Hitler or perhaps Mussolini had exerted pressure on Franco, sooner or later Spain would have entered the war on the Axis side. But Hitler, Hitler uh, changed his plans, uh, perhaps because of more urgent matters, or he considered that Spain's entry to the war would not be decisive uh, or of utmost importance. Um, I'm specialized, especially at the Franco regime, so the history, politics, international relations, and also cinema, the Francoist regime, what we still don't have the exact answer. So the one and only answer, only a mosaic uh, of answers. But it's also sure that a few days after the meeting between Franco and Hitler in France, Hitler would famously tell uh, Mussolini about Franco, and I quote him, I prefer to have three or four of my own teeth pulled out than to speak to that man again. End of the quote. Um, it is quite clear that Hitler um, hated Franco. He did not trust this Hispanic guy, as he, he sometimes called him. Franco created the so-called policy of the three fronts during the Second World War. According to this policy, three simultaneous wars were taking place. That of the Axis powers against the Soviet Union, in which Spain was favorable to the Axis, the second front, the war of the Axis against the Allies, uh, in which it was basically neutral. And the third, the war of the Pacific, where he claimed that it was necessary to defeat the Japanese because they were, among other qualifiers, barbarians, according to the ideology uh, of the Francoist dictatorship. The position of Franco and his government would evolve throughout the conflict, always maintaining an ambiguous neutrality when it was beneficial uh, for their interests. Thus, um, after the Battle of France in June 1940, and when it seemed inevitable that Germany would defeat the United Kingdom, where it seemed to be the situation, Franco allowed the refueling of German submarines in Spanish ports. News of German defeats were censored in Spanish propaganda. It, they were eliminated from the Spanish press. And the German military intelligence agents had great freedom to work in Spain. There was an agreement between uh, Madrid and Berlin. Any German resident in Spain and suspected of not supporting the Nazi cause could be detained and repatriated immediately. The Gestapo agents in Madrid were in charge of ensuring this, uh, this mission. In most, uh, in most cases, um, spies acted under the identity of businessmen and used um, important business groups as, um, as covers. Also, pro-German and pro-Italian propaganda 
uh, appeared in Spanish newspapers and newsreels during the war. Franco also offered Germany the famous Blue Division. It was a unit of Spanish volunteers that formed an infantry, infantry division to fight against the Soviet Union. Um, between 1941 and 43, about 50,000 Spanish soldiers took part in various battles, mainly related to the siege of uh, Leningrad. The, the British and American ambassadors found it very difficult to prevent Spain from entering World War II on the side of Nazi Germany or the fascist Italy. Their worries uh, were based on the fact that Spain was one of the gates of the Mediterranean Sea. If Germany had military bases on Spanish territory, it could disrupt communications between democratic countries. On the other hand, if the Spanish ports of the Atlantic coast fell into German hands, the, the convoys uh, from Africa and Asia that supplied Great Britain uh, would be more exposed to attacks by submarines or, or bombers. However, um, despite the, the general belief that Spain, under the command of General Franco, would quickly join the Axis powers, one factor was clearly acting as a, as a restraint. The deep crisis the nation, the Spanish nation, was going through after the civil war. Spain was, was ruined by the devastations that occurred during uh, the years of the civil war, and also because of the crisis that took over the country after the war ended. The vengeance, for example, that Franco uh, used against his opposition. Also, Spain depended on the trade with Great Britain and the United States to supply the population with food and the economy with oil. Without a doubt, uh, an Anglo-American embargo could, um, could blockade the country and push its inhabitants into famine. The Spanish Minister of Foreign Affairs explained to Hitler that they needed these shipments to prevent Spanish life from being paralyzed. Despite the, the disastrous situation of Spain after the Civil War, it was still able to supply some essential items to Germany. There were a series of, a series of, um, of trade agreements between the two countries, which had been signed when Germany supported the nationalists during the civil war in uh, 1937. The main resource was Wolfram, or in, uh, in another word, tungsten, but usually we say Wolfram. Uh, extracted by German mining companies in Spain. It was fundamental to Germany for its advanced engineering and therefore for the production of weapons. Spanish raw materials um, continued to arrive to Germany until August 1944, when the Allied advance through the south of France cut off all land communication between Spain and Germany. The sale of Spanish uh, minerals to the Nazis was justified as a, as a result of the valuable military support and supplies that the Nazis had given uh, to the nationalists during the, the Spanish Civil War. Other minerals that the Spanish also sold almost entirely to the Germans were iron, lead, and mercury. Spain also acted as a, a mediator for Germany to obtain certain goods and merchandise from Latin America. Latin America was crucial for uh, Germany in the propaganda as well. In November 1942, uh, Spain perceived that the conflict took a complete turn. After the success of the American landings in Morocco and Algeria, and also the events at the Battle of Stalingrad, Franco quickly understood the new situation and returned to neutrality, from non-belligerence to neutrality. After receiving information uh, on concentration camps, the Spanish government decided that Spanish diplomats 
in European countries could issue visa to Jews who requested it if they provided their Spanish nationality with complete documentation. Um, however, most of the Spanish diplomats helped all Jews who sought for their protection. The most famous case, um, I think many Hungarian historians know this case, but in case if someone ignores it, um, the most famous case is the mission of the Spanish diplomat Angel Sansbris in Budapest, Hungary, who in 1944 saved the life of more than 5,000 Jews. Unlike what happened uh, with the other high humanitarian actions of the Spanish diplomats, that of Sansbris in Hungary did have the implied, although not explicit, uh, approval of the Spanish government. So they did not give permission, but they did not prohibit this uh, mission until the moment. In late 1944, it was easy to foresee the defeat of Hitler. Sans Breeze's attitude served as an alibi uh, for the Franco regime in its efforts to convince the Allies that it no longer had anything in common with Nazi Germany. The Pacific case was a speci special case, uh, the special Pacific Front. I know that this Congress is about Europe, but I'd like to say under two minutes about the special, um, uh, the Pacific Front from the Spanish perspective, because it, uh, it is a compulsory and important element for the European uh, front as well. Because at the Pacific Front, uh, Spanish soldiers, missionaries, merchants, spies were present, united under the American flag with the aim of defeating the Japanese Imperial Army. And they were exiles. So they were not Franco's people. They were Spaniards who fled Spain because of Franco. After the defeat of the Republicans of the Spanish Civil War, a great number of Spanish exiles emigrated to the former Spanish colonies, especially the Philippines. After the outbreak of the conflict between Japan and the United States in 1941, uh, the Francoist press praised the Japanese conquest and asked the Spanish who lived there to help the Japanese allies. Despite this, the Spanish helped the American side in the, in the Pacific front waging a real guerrilla war against the Japanese. The majority of the Spaniards suffered persecution for their religious beliefs in, in the Philippines. Um, in 1944, 1944, the US arrived to the Philippines, to Manila, where the Japanese unleashed uh, a massacre. Japanese officials ordered hundreds of Spanish and Filipino civilians to be brought out to execute them in cold blood. With the Manila massacre, massacre, the Francoist press changed its opinion. No ally could do such a thing to uh, Japanese citizens, pardon, to Spanish citizens, Spanish citizens. Um, among the members of the Spanish government, the declaration of war on Japan was even raised. They sympathized with Germany and Italy, but not with Japan because of this massacre. There was no risk then because the war was practically over and for the future it would seem for the Allies that Franco finally did something good. Even the idea of a new blue division, so the division like it was sent uh, to aid to help the Germans earlier, the kind of new blue division was conceived for the purpose of fighting the Japanese. The idea was finally rejected, but Spain cut its diplomatic relations with Japan in April 1945. Um, and what about the consequences? Uh, after the war, it's also a famous story, but uh, and it's also researched and investigated, but not as deep as it should be. Um, that after the war, former officials and collaborators of Nazi Germany sought refuge in Spain, in particular some of those responsible for the deportation and extermination of the Jews. The Spanish state helped uh, thousands of Nazi collaborators, gave asylum to war criminals. However, yielding to international pressure, the Franco government handed over several 
of them to the United States for, for later trial. According to recent investigations, it is believed that more than 40,000 Nazis from all over Western Europe and uh, other parts of Europe uh, took refuge in Spain when the war ended. And, but the majority of them used Spain as a transit country before heading to Argentina, where the government of Juan Domingo Perón gave them asylum. Juan Domingo Perón and Francisco Franco were collaborators or friends, I would say friends. Evita Perón uh, even visited Franco uh, later. So they were in collaboration. So it was natural for Franco to mediate, to be a mediator in the Nazis' um, voyage travel to, to Argentina. And what is the other consequence? And this is the last segment, uh, last thought of my presentation, is that um, after the Second World War, the democratic countries regarded Spain as a far-right survivor of the war and isolated Spain. They did not want any contact with Spain. Most members of the recently established United Nations withdrew the ambassadors from Spain. This situation worsened the economic impact of the post-civil war period in Spain, from which the country would not recover until, until well into the 1950s. The, the Cold War brought a new period, because as Franco had been a determined anti-communist since the beginning of the 1930s, the West, especially the United States and Great Britain, needed Spain's alliance in their, their fight, in their struggle against the, the Soviet bloc. Several contracts and cooperations were signed in the 1950s and Spain was also admitted to the United Nations in 1955. Therefore, um, although Spain was neutral or non-belligerent during the Second World War, but as we have seen in this brief and superficial presentation, um, Spain was highly involved in this conflict. It had an important role as a non-belligerent or as a neutral country, but important role both in the conflict and both in its consequences. Spain is the only far-right or semi-fascist survival uh, of the Second World War. Uh, and Spain had to modify its, um, its ideology and its involvement in everyday struggles, everyday uh, cases, everyday actions in order to survive until 1975. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Now it's the time for the questions. You, you started uh, your lecture with the with the fact that uh, the uh, Spanish Civil War it's one of the prelude of of uh, of uh, Second World War and from this point I started to think that uh, if we think about the the responsibility of the Second World War uh, we generally speak about the active appeasement, I mean München and I mean the um, in, uh, importance of the Western powers in the Czechish question or the Austrian question. But it's interesting that in the public opinion, we can we speak much less um, about the Spanish uh, about the Spanish war, but but practically the two axis power was in one side and on the other side there were none of the Western powers and the Soviet Union only in the meaning of the supporting of international brigades but not with uh, Soviet troops. What do you think? Uh, what, what is the reason? Why, why don't uh, think the 
public opinion uh, think about the the responsibility of Western powers uh, uh, in that in the, in that uh, case. Well, the Spanish public opinion. Uh, think about it. So, mm -hmm. although it's a civil war, as I said, it's a fratricidal war where brothers killed brothers uh, and fathers as well. So. Uh, it was a war uh, inside families as well. Uh, the Spanish people, so Spanish society and Spanish historians, they usually pointed out that this was not only a national war. So mm -hmm. Germans and Italians uh, backing Franco, the international brigades, as you mentioned, um, volunteers as well, um, aided or supported the Republican side. The Soviet Union, not with troops, uh, but uh, with some well, uh, economic uh, support they, they gave uh, to the Republicans, but not uh, as much as Germans and Italians to the other side, to the nationalists. Uh, yes, so I think in the universal history, when they write about the Second World War and they write about the preludes uh, of the Second World War, um, they usually pointed out that many for example, many uh, military tactics, military maneuvers, or new types of weapons were uh, tried, uh, were experimented in the Spanish Civil War. So for ex the Germans, uh, for example, when they bombed Guernica with the Condor Legion, uh, they used those types of bombs and weapons uh, that they will use in the Second World War as well. So the, for all these powers, it was an experimental ground, the Spanish Civil War. Um, and yes, I think the Spanish Civil War would, um, would need a, a more profound and more uh, specialized attention when we talk about the Second World War, because this is really a prelude. So it was just the, when it was terminated, when it was finalized, the Second World War uh, started. And uh, Italy and uh, Germany uh, knew perfectly how their weapons um, can work on the battleground, on a battlefield, especially because they sent these weapons to the Spanish Civil War. So Franco helped them in this manner as well, in this, in this way, to, to be an experimental ground or field for the Spanish Civil War. And I think, yeah, it's a pity or that's a pity, but uh, uh, it would need uh, more attention to, to be focused on the Spanish Civil War when we talk about the Second uh, World War. Yes. I have a question as well. Um, yeah. That I, One thing that would make Spain different from Italy and Germany is that it uh, my, my sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, there, there's not, nothing really in the ideology that supports the idea of a, of a, of a sort of a grand imperial adventure, right? We're, we're fascist Italy, mm -hmm. you have this fantasy about reviving the Roman Empire, of course, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's um, <laughs> crazy racial fantasies as well, whereas Spain is completely exhausted in 1940. There's, re there's no real program out there, even in terms of the ideology that would support continuing you know the expenditure of of lives and blood and resources in a war and if you go talk to you know hitler in the fall of 1940 i mean it's like maybe a little bit of france or whatever but but nothing grand that would support um their entry which would have been of course incredibly foolhardy and instead more a program of consolidation within the state right i mean spain had been through its imperial adventure and it had suffered defeats as recently as 50 years prior um, anything in terms of the foreign policy, I guess, to sort of uh, add a little more um, comment to to your your talk. Yeah, yes, um, yeah. Uh, Spain lost its uh, last colonies uh, in 1898, uh, so as a consequence of the Spanish-American War, and uh, this was a great, I think, well, almost the greatest tragedy for the Spanish society, for uh, for their thinking. For their philosophy so if i don't know if some of you know the generation of uh, 98 uh, writers historians philosophers like uh, miguel de unamuno uh, ortega y gasset um, uh, also uh, added uh, some thoughts uh, to this so for them uh, as you mentioned um, a real uh, imperial 
thought uh, they did not have. But for example, uh, Franco's father uh, fought in the Spanish-American War. So he had this um, familiar, I mean, this family experience from the last battle of the, uh, of the empire, of the Spanish empire. And he, Franco himself, had in mind uh, the reunification of the Hispanic empire, but not um, in a real way, like Italy and Germany. So go there and conquer them with uh, weapons. Not in that way. But um, on, um, on a philosophical and cultural, cultural way. So uh, Spain's uh, main ideology was the notion of Hispanidad. Uh, Hispanidad, Hispanity. So all Hispanic races. And it's interesting that Franco used the word race more often than Hitler. Because, but he used this as a Hispanic race the superior Hispanic race, but he did not use this ideology to exterminate other, other races like Hitler did with Jews. Um, so this imperial thought of the Hispa uh, Hispanidad, Hispanic um, imperialism did exist, but he knew he was aware that he cannot uh, reunify Latin America with Spain. It was just uh, out of the question. So he wanted to gain um, their um, sympathy with propaganda. And this is why he was more, uh, very important for Hitler as well uh, in case of Latin America. Not only the German and Italian minorities in Latin America were important uh, for Hitler and uh, Mussolini, but also those Spanish um, relations that Latin America had, because that was also a kind of channel to Latin America. So the, uh, this, um, and from the civil war until the end of the dictatorship in 75, the main point of uh, the foreign policy for Franco was this Hispanism, Hispanidad, all Spanish races, or uh, 17 countries in Latin America plus Spain. And um, he was able, Franco and he, his governments, were able to to accommodate themselves or to 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 change their policies according to the times that came. So uh, they could also, um, and from the fifties, they were you know they had good relations with the U.S. with the Western. Until then, all, only with Portugal, Argentina, and the Vatican were the three states that supported Franco uh, from the end of the Second World War until uh, 53. From then, he was uh, open, Franco was open to everyone, but his Hispanidad and anti-communism were the two um, key keywords and key theories in all his international relations, also with Hungary and with uh, our bloc and with all countries. So these were the two elements that remained uh, unchanged and unmodified until the end of the dictatorship. Other elements were modified as as times uh, as time came by. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. I uh, had also some additional remarks, if it's yeah. possible. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, this balancing on the surface uh, between the allied powers and the Axis powers. But uh, if we um, see the deep structures, um, um, these are um, closer uh, to Germany. You mentioned uh, uh, Gestapo, uh, press, uh, economical um, uh, connections. And um, if we see all the other surfaces, um, uh, like uh, youth connections, um, uh, uh, these are faced to Germany. Uh, Pilar Primo de Rivera is uh, one of the, the leading persons uh, also in the European Youth Association uh, or, um, or the connections uh, uh, from Lufthansa uh, over Iberia uh, to move in in the um, uh, Ibero-American world. Uh, so if, if we add all these um, structures, I think uh, it's, it's, um, 
it's um, um, a very close connection uh, to to Germany. And thank you for the uh, presentation. Yeah. yeah, it was and some elements that I did not mention and I won't uh, go into details just in a word. So in fields of propaganda, cinema, literature, culture, as you mentioned, the youth associations with Pilar Primo de Rivera and uh, some other collaborators. Yes, yeah, so these relations were quite close, uh, much closer than we would think uh, without making deep research in this. So yeah, um, this non-belligerence was almost belligerence, but non-belligerence. But if for a Spanish person, who lived in Spain in that time during the Second World War, um, based on the newspapers, the news, the newsreels, the films, the I don't know the the debates in cafes, it would uh, seem to be a belligerent country. So they were so pro-German, pro-Nazi in the society and uh, the politicians. Just they were not fighting uh, on the battlefields; only the blue division. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there is no more question, okay, I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Egri Gabor. His uh, institutional background, uh, the uh, history of politics institute. Uh, uh, perhaps it's not uh, deep information or a very exact information our uh, um, uh, uh, American and, and uh, non-Hungarian friends, but uh, you have to know that uh, in this institute, which now led by Gabor, is one of uh, the symbolic uh, point of the uh, contemporary Hungarian anti-fascism, since uh, this institute is one of the place uh, uh, which uh, uh, would like to host it uh, out by the uh, contemporary government and um, as you heard uh, sometimes in in this uh, conference the uh, contemporary government one of the um, uh, how can i say the supporters the the positive memory of the pre 45 uh, uh, system so i wouldn't like to say more about uh, uh, gabor agri but uh, uh, i would like to ask him uh, uh, say his lecture well so thank you very much for this introduction and thank you very much for the possibility to present something at this conference, uh, a bit of a patient I need from the audience. I will try to share a presentation, which is yes. So uh, yes, we see it. We see it. Okay. So thank you. Uh, so uh, this is a conference on the Second World War, and uh, I used to. Uh, tour these conferences with a very similar presentation. So please forgive me for doing it. Recently, I have moved to study the First World War and its immediate aftermath. Uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, I hope to demonstrate also with this paper I'm giving today that sometimes uh, it is possible to connect uh, these two wars uh, in unexpected ways, not just how they are usually connected by public intellectuals in public discourse or even by historians. The topic I try to uh, outline very briefly today is uh, how the Second World War and obviously the huge social transformations the Second World War directly caused within the society of a region in Eastern uh, Europe, which is quite far from both the Netherlands and uh, Spain. I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> it doesn't to, move. The, to the next slide, and it doesn't work quite well. Okay, so yes, no. Now so, it's okay. Okay, so I hope you can see uh, the region here. 
Uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen similar maps quite often. It is very typical to illustrate what happened to some of Hungary's territories at the end of the second or end of the First World War. The intention is rather to highlight that there is a huge, more than 100,000 square kilometers large area that was annexed to Romania, and most of it, or around 60,000 kilometers, belonged to a historical, political and administrative entity, the former principality and later great principality of Transylvania. And during the interwar years, this area was the home to uh, to something that is usually approached by historiography at a more cultural and intellectual level through intellectual history, history of cultural interactions. And that is called Transylvanism, a kind of regional identification that is supposed to express some commonalities of the three uh, significant uh, uh, national groups, Germans, Romanians, Hungarians, who populated the area at that time. Uh, it was less associated with Jews, as Jews, as bearer of, of a special, specific Jewish culture, uh, but they were not excluded as assimilated to one of these uh, national groups. My, uh, and uh, another interesting issue that was taken up by historiography, and not just recently, but actually by more than 25, or around 25 years ago, most importantly by Irina Ligazeanu, is political regionalism within the titular nation uh, that ruled, sup supposedly ruled interwar Romania among Romanians and uh, the political uh, current within the Transylvanian Romanian elites that was reflected uh, in certain political goals of uh, devolution, soft autonomy, regional autonomy, uh, and also within in the political discourse, very uh, uh, much populated by elements that were othering in one way or another the Romanians outside of this region. What I'm trying to very briefly uh, show today, so basically it's my argument, is, uh, again, I had some problems with the presentation, so I hope you will, <laughs> you will be uh, patient, is uh, another aspect of this uh, regionalism. Uh, what I would say is a kind of everyday aspect of the regionalism on using the analogy of everyday nationhood, everyday nationalism. Okay. Uh, how it was rooted within certain specificities of the society of the region that were also the legacies of its past in dualist Hungary and also within Austria-Hungary before the First World War. Uh, and uh, how it underpinned that kind of political trends within Hungarian uh, society, but also within Romanian society that were labeled as regionalists, uh, and how the changes affecting that kind of society actually contributed to the disappearance of the uh, Transylvanism as a political uh, idea, not necessarily in cultural terms. Uh, so, what we can uh, observe in interwar Romania, and in this sense, this retrospective perspective enables us to much better see how uh, the society worked before the First World War, is a kind of common middle-class soci societal culture within uh, within the region uh, that was ma that manifested itself most importantly in situations where the inhabitants of the region, irrespective of their nationality, interacted with people or groups coming from outside. Uh, um, mainly in areas that are usually not associated with uh, high culture, national culture, not considered to be the core of national culture, which is, I think, 
Joseph Leslie. Uh, self-explanatory. Uh, but nevertheless, it was strong enough to create a milieu that was unfamiliar for most people who were coming from outside the, uh, the society of the former Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Uh, just to name a few of the most important aspects, uh, especially the le leisure uh, activities and the new media were connected to this, with this kind of middle-class uh, post-imperial, so to say, societal culture. Uh, uh, for example, Hungarian operettas were quite popular, even among the Romanian middle class, Hungarian movies as well, Hungarian theatrical troops were touring the uh, region with success and their audience was not limited to, to the Hungarians uh, living there, but also Romanians. At least, uh, if one tries to assess the phenomenon on the basis of denunciations against Romanians who appeared on these uh, uh, on these events, uh, it was quite frequent. Uh, and uh, they also, uh, Hungarian radio was also very popular in the region and not just again among uh, Hungarians, but also among Romanians as testified to by, uh, by the number of uh, radio uh, permits, but also by such banal uh, issues like uh, which radio program was printed as, as the first one in the uh, newspapers uh, that led to a kind of intervention of the state that wanted to change the typical uh, order, the Hungarian, the Budapest program being the first and the Bucharest program being the second. In, this, in a sense, uh, very much showing how the Budapest was more interesting for the for the locals. But it was uh, how it manifested itself. However, how this culture could have manifested some kind of subtle but very uh, significant differences, and how it get, could have been used to pointedly or deliberately show these differences. This one case uh, I use it, this example. Uh, almost always, but I think it's a very telling story that happened in the year of 1932 when a few travelers from Bucharest spent their holiday in the mountain resort of Predeal over uh, uh, Brasov, Kronstadt, uh, Brasov, and they descended to the city to enjoy city life for an afternoon, uh, and when they entered uh, the local Aro Hotel, which was also a kind of uh, architectural landmark of the city, a new Bauhaus-like modernist building. Uh, what they encountered there was a crowd of locals, an inter-ethnic crowd of locals, enjoying the music played by the, military, the band of the local military regiment, an allied unit of the Romanian army, a mountain uh, regiment, actually. And, uh, uh, and when they experienced that the military band of a Romanian regiment played a song which was uh, uh, familiar for, which was uh, familiar but also unfamiliar for them. So they knew the song. It was a famous song of a Hungarian operetta, Armin Sketter's Pokova Jokena, I'm a private in the third, uh, uh, 32nd regiment, uh, which was. Uh, labeled as an irredentist song by the Romanian state security, they actually denounced the, the locals, the scene, the military band, it's not quite clear to the authorities as, uh, as, uh, as a group that have committed uh, irredentist propaganda. And uh, what we rather see here is, is the unfamiliarity of someone who came from Bucharest to a city where that kind of culture was still enjoyed uh, uh, in an ethnic setting. Uh, and no one really thought that just listening to this operetta song was uh, the irredentist demonstration, could have been any kind of irredentist demonstration. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, there were certain professional cultures among lawyers or, uh, or judges that uh, 
the locals felt being threatened by uh, by the extension of the rules and laws of the old kingdom to the area uh, and that was the sphere of life from where uh, the political regionalism uh, obviously uh, was fueled by which the political regionalism was obviously fewer uh, nevertheless it's quite important to see that uh, such uh, demonstrations of otherness manifestations of otherness were uh, or could have been uh, the signs of a deeper rooted uh, regional uh, identification which was possible to mobilize for political purpose by the regionalists and not just Romanian regionalists but also by Hungarian regionalists as well as we will see a bit later. So, uh, but it was also uh, characterized by a kind of extreme situationality, so it was easily used uh, against Romanians from other parts of the country, but also against Hungarians who were still easy to characterize as uh, former oppressors. Uh, uh, so, if one looks at the discursive aspects of this kind of regionalism, but also at such events as I try to use to illustrate uh, the everyday aspect, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, fascinating to see how much uh, people who were familiar with this milieu could use, uh, use uh, features like language use uh, or the consumption of culture or the listening to the radio, or whatever, to uh, recast the boundaries between groups and, uh, and somehow bring together uh, Transylvanians against whatever others were on the sea. Uh, however, in 1940, uh, the northern part of the region was returned to Hungary and it was the start of a process that actually undermined the social foundations of this kind of uh, regionalism. Uh, the most important in this uh, process was uh, the practical uh, expulsion of the Romanian middle class from the northern part of Transylvania, uh, followed by and also caused by restrictive measures of the Hungarian government, which were uh, reciprocated by the Romanian government against Hungarians living in the southern part of the uh, of the region uh, that was uh, accompanied by a mutual suspicion uh, and not just at the political level but also uh, at the social level and also aggravated by the fact that uh, in both countries given that Hungary and uh, Romania nominally allies were still looking at each other as potential enemies uh, the people were in a certain sense forced to uh, by, by the propaganda but also by the expectations of the state and society to modify their biographies and gloss over this kind of commonality that the regionalism that was the social basis of this regionalism uh, so hungarians who wanted to have a job or whatever in northern transylvania had to uh, forget and never to tell about uh, their commonalities with Romanians and vice versa. Romanians were rather expected uh, when they arrived to Romania, when they arrived to the uh, to the southern part of the region, and when they were interrogated by the state organs uh, about their experiences in northern Transylvania, to tell uh, the most horrific stories and. Uh, uh, and the propaganda worked like propaganda used to work, so they used every opportunity to denigrate the other, to cast the situation both in the north and in the south as uh, bad as it could be or one could imagine. So the real uh, ongoing persecution of both Hungarians and Romanians in the respective countries. Uh, and there was a political aspect of this process as well, not just the disintegration of the milieu of, uh, of this middle class, the common milieu of this middle class, also what the refugees meant for Romania. They had a 
very important uh, political weight within the country, even though uh, General Yolantuesco ruled Romania uh, uh, also with Aryan Bay. And they offered symbolic capital for one of the most prominent Transylvanian politicians who was also uh, uh, the symbolic figure of the opposition to authoritarianism in Romania, uh, Julio Maniu. In the meantime, in the Hungarian part, in the north, a regionalist party emerged and became a kind of coalition partner for the Budapest government, which, however, although labeled itself as a Transylvanist regionalist party, uh, RDI part, that is the Hungarian uh, name, so Transylvanian party, that's probably the best translation. Uh, it was not regionalist in the sense as the uh, as regionalism existed in the interwar years, but rather exchanged this regionalism for something what one can call subsidiaristic nationalism. So a form of nationalism which formulates uh, and uh, and promotes nationalist goals, uh, but also lays a claim on authenticity uh, uh, against the influence of the center. Uses the idea that the own regional national group is much more authentic in national terms than the center is, and also claims to have the necessary expertise uh, to handle the dangers arising from the region, what the uh, center itself lacks. So very uh, succinctly, this is the idea that uh, uh, the Romanians are a real danger for Hungarians and the Romanians should be uh, dealt with this way, so with basically uh, with oppression, but nevertheless it's, uh, it's not the task of the Budapest government to do it because they don't know how to do it, they don't know the region, they don't know how to strengthen the Hungarians, but also what is really dangerous uh, coming from the Romanians. It is the task of the local regional Hungarian elite to carry out that kind of uh, policies, while the center has only one duty to support unconditionally this local elite in their endeavor. So relent on political power, give uh, as much autonomy for the local national elite to pursue these nationalist goals, which is probably easy to understand how, contribu how it contributed again to the undermining of that kind of uh, subtle and fine con uh, uh, commonalities, social commonalities. The next step was the end of the war, when the Hungarian and the uh, Romanian middle class suffered a kind of asymmetric fate. Uh, uh, the Romanian middle class was relatively quickly uh, uh, brought to uh, jail and imprisoned by the communist government, while the Hungarians, uh, uh, while the Hungarians uh, served as a kind of allies of the Romanian communists in this endeavor, but enjoyed a certain autonomy and their uh, organization, the Hungarian. Uh, popular associ uh, uh, association. Gabor, you are close to your last minute. Okay, I'm uh, practically at the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, so, uh, they, they within this uh, organization, the Hungar new Hungarian elite used the expertise of the old Hungarian middle class for a few years offered positions for this middle class within the organization, within this kind of uh, national uh, uh, personal national autonomy, so to say, uh, and it came a few years later to the elimination, the similar method of elimination of the Hungarian middle class. So by uh, 19, around 1950, uh, both middle classes were eliminated in a sense, and the social basis of this everyday regionalism also disappeared with them. Uh, what came uh, in the form of uh, uh, supposedly unified uh, leftist communist uh, workers' movement and its and the new elite growing out of it was, uh, was very different in the sense that they did not have the same uh, uh, same traditions uh, originating from the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. They had something 
different, which, uh, which define the commonalities differently and uh, not focusing on, on the region and also not focusing on this Austro-Hungarian and dualist Hungarian legacy. So, uh, in lieu of conclusion, just very briefly, what I argue in this paper is that transhumanism was more than just an intellectual dream or just a cultural idea. Its resilience uh, was based on, uh, on a social basis within the middle class that had identical, uh, that was also identical with the social basis of nation building and that provided it with extreme flexibility. Under the strain uh, with the rise of radical nationalist math move movement in the 30s, uh, it, uh, the first cracks started to appear, but it still held. But with the Second World War and uh, with the territorial changes, uh, it was almost completely undermined and the communist takeover and the sidelining or elimination of the middle, this traditional middle class was the last straw that broke the camel's back. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your lecture. And uh, that's the time for questions. Questions? Questions? Okay, if there is no other question, um, are you sure that the transhumanism in any meaning ended? Because if you see the last um, three, four election in Romania, the, uh, the uh, cleavages uh, in the Romanian political map are uh, absolutely the same. Where, when, uh, where you, you see the old Romania, the so-called regat, uh, contra Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, supported, for example, every, in every, every district, uh, uh, that was the majority of the, of the uh, contemporary president. And on the regat district, uh, every um, uh, 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 every uh, district uh, supported his his, uh, his uh, populist nationalist uh, opposer. So up to now, uh, Transylvanism or that special tradition of that uh, uh, belonged uh, belonging to the West. It's a kind of um, it's a kind of issue in Transylvanians. Or if you see the the mid-war mid -war cleavages, the national that, that in that time that were two party, uh, one that national peasant party and the other the liberal party. Okay, the national peasant party was not peasant and the liberal party was not liberal. It's okay, but the liberal party was supported by Regat and the National Peasant Party was supported by Transylvania. So that kind of deep uh, things uh, remained perhaps an absolutely other cultural, um, uh, but, but in some meaning that's belonging to the West, it somehow remained as a, as a tradition of, of Transylvania. Well, thank you. I'm, I agree that uh, if you look at these uh, uh, issues, there is something that resembles uh, that kind of regionalism. Uh, I still would be cautious to call it transhumanism, at least in the sense as transhumanism existed in the interwar years, or probably up to the end of the Second World War. Uh, the, and I have uh, a few uh, uh, reasons to do it. The first one is that uh, it's to a certain extent, I think it's natural that uh, over a certain size of a national group, these kind of uh, subtle differences appear and people will become aware of 
the fact that they are not necessarily exactly the same as their co-nationals. And they make it clear or manifest it in the forms of jokes, uh, swear words, uh, negative stereotypes, whatever. But it's not necessarily, it's, it's, it's still not a political uh, issue. Uh, the second, uh, and this is uh, pertains to the politics, that the transhumanism was a relatively well-established uh, political current, which, uh, and uh, my argument is more about its social foundations and why it was uh, relatively successful in mobilizing people uh, with these goals while explicitly formulating some kind of regionalist agenda. And today, this kind of regionalist agenda is missing from politics. So what you can see is the different voting patterns, uh, although they are, if you look at the maps of the last three or four elections, there are cracks in that wall uh, running along the spine of the Carpathians. Some southern Transylvanian counties are now tending to vote more to the Pesede or so like Moldova. Uh, the southern Bukovina has completely disappeared from this map. It's like Moldova and not uh, similar to Transylvania anymore. There is Bistrica Neseud that is also sometimes voting uh, irregularly uh, by the standard of differences. Uh, so my argument is basically about the fact that this kind of uh, uh, deeply embedded social practices were fundamental for formulating a regionalist agenda because they served as one of the uh, one of the not necessarily the means of mobilizing people but one of the bases uh, of the difference that made it easier for people to really recognize how much their world was different from the one the Old Kingdom Romanians or the Hungarians from Hungary, by the for that matter, uh, represented. And this is, and this is, I think, really important. Uh, so I would say that uh, what we see today is more the result of uh, of uh, a few. Uh, but more, uh, maybe that's not, it's not necessarily the, the best uh, term to use, ephemeral issues, more uh, dispersed uh, within society uh, and more connected to that kind of uh, uh, typical uh, self-differentiations, what is also or to, present in in relations between Hungarians from northeastern Hungary and Zola, if you look at that one. So people recognize different dialects uh, mm -hmm. that they consider funny, whatever. The, the only issue that is, uh, I think, uh, in certainly goes back to the interwar and to a certain extent also to, to before the First World War is the discursive aspect that kind of civilizational differentiation which uh, locates Transylvania at a higher civilizational level than the Old Kingdom. Practically, in its most, uh, in its promptest form, it claims that Transylvania is Central Europe and the Old Kingdom is the Balkans. So any influence from Old Kingdom, Romania, uh, is just the Balkanization of the, of the region. Thank you. Perhaps some question uh, question appeared. No. One, two, three. Thank you uh, for your uh, for, for your lecture, Gabor. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, I would like to introduce the Tironan. Are you here?
Diti? I'm here, sorry. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> yes, um, her institutional background uh, is the Hebrew uh, University, uh, but uh, she is uh, not uh, only or not a, not a typical scholar in the meaning that uh, in a period of her life, uh, uh, she was involved in the um, Israeli uh, cultural policy because uh, she was uh, 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 advisor or, or uh, employ employed person in the in the Ministry of Culture as, as a, a cultural advisor. And uh, uh, now uh, she will uh, uh, bring now a um, cultural topic, uh, 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 if I see. It's your flow. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the, this conference. I'm a Jewish poet from Israel. So I'm not in historian, but as the daughter of, an Hungar of a Hungarian Holocaust survivor, a meaningful, a meaningful part of my poetry has to do with the last year of the Second World War. Towards the end of 1944, after the Red Army victory in Stalingrad, the Germans were forced to evacuate the camps in the Eastern European regions, and mass transports of Jews were brought to Stutthof, destined for extermination. The greatest number of transports to arrive in Stutthof, mostly of women, came from Auschwitz. My mother, Edith Friedman, a beautiful young woman, was among those 50,000 Jews that entered Stutthof during 1944. The story of my mother was never told directly, as she never spoke about it in an orderly, chronological way. There were memories that emerged suddenly, uncontrolled, usually in the night, and they disappeared by morning when she made up her face and went elegant and proud to perform her teaching position. I arrived at the Stutthof archive on my search for more information about her journey during the last year of the war and the months following the war, when she was still wandering homeless, being forced into the hunger marsh and then running away from Russian soldiers. From my search in the Stutthof archives, I realized that she arrived at the Stutthof death camp from Auschwitz on July 20, 1944. After being in Auschwitz for more than months, seeing her beloved mother, father, her young cousins and other members of the family taken away from her and sent to the gas chambers, she was very weak, hungry, cold and frightened. My mother stayed there at least until November 23rd, when her beloved aunt, Elizabeth Eust, died. I know it because she told me about this death. This I have also learned from digging in the archive, the date of the death of Elizabeth Eust. The plan to exterminate all the new arrivals failed due to the typhus epidemic. The crematorium could not keep up with disposing of corpse. The prisoners who managed to endure the starvation, humiliation, cold, beating, and disease were waiting for the death. At the end of November 44, my mother was crammed into one of the 20 unnamed sub-camps 
to dig trenches against the Russian tanks. There, in the excessive work of the Hoch and Tiefbau subcamp in a forest near Elbang, she saw for the first time a sign of hope. The poem Little Bird that I'm going to read now tells about this hope. I will try to share this, uh, the poem on the screen. Let's see if it works. Okay, it works. Little bird, begin from above, slowly, in a blue so light, so light, and wide and big and white. Begin with infinity, begin with the sky, with the bird. Look, she is taking off, one bird, little. Look, there she flies, begin and open. The entire sky is in front of her. Begin with the bigness. Yes, begin big from above. Big. Begin with the all-seeing point of view, the innocent point of view, the point of view of God who does not see the detail. Were there other birds? Was there a chirp? There was. Surely there was. There, another bird taking off. Begin with the horizon. Do you still see it? Do you still see on it any wisp of smoke? No, it is not dusk yet. You cannot see a thing. And the horizon is far, and the sea is close, and the sun is in mid-sky. Now tree tops peek out, appearing, begin with the tree tops. They spread evergreen, their fingers yearn for the, for the tall, the divine, the God looking upon them, for the bird. Did the sun indeed shine? And what was the shape of the cloud? God, watching, did he notice the bird? Begin with the tree, with the bow. See how it hugs the trunk, leaning on it ever so trustingly. It too is quiet, slightly moved by the wind, cuddling itself softly, humming the sounds of its origins. Have you noticed the nest? Have you seen the nestling? Begin with the tree, with the tree next to it. Remember the bird? It descends here to sit on a bow. Begin with hair. No, begin with the tree. No, begin with the tree next to her tree. Begin with more trees, many trees, a forest. Now look. From above, can you see the forest clearing? Look, there are lager barracks there. Begin with the barrack. It does not matter which one. They, all, they are all alike. Begin with the 10th barrack. Look, a handsome woman now leaves it. Her walk is proud. Did you draw her? Draw her pretty Please, pretty, bold, and proud. Did you see her round face turned slender, accentuating big blue eyes? She looks up, sees blue skies, speak, sneaking between the tree tops that you drew, and tip and the tip of a cloud, shaped like a longing. She notices in, in detail, remembers scent and flavor, color and sound before, thinking spring, sees the bird passing in front of her, gliding, her wings spread open. 
Begin with the officer. Draw him tall. Accentuate his face, please. It is squared. Draw his strong jaw, his chink sticking out. Now the hair, carefully done, his head hanging in a sloppy elegance. Have you seen his uniform? The emblems on his sleeves. Begin with the rifle. The officer holds the rifle in his hands. He stands by the barrack, the rifle in his hand. Now he lifts the weapon, aiming to the sky, pressing his cheek against the weapon, closing a non-aiming eye and searching. Draw him tall and very straight. He looks through the crosshair, up. He is searching. What shall he shoot now? The bird now stands on a branch. Draw him looking. Draw the look. He moves, turning to the woman. Look. He forgets his mask, his mark. His muscles relax. Draw the gun descending, slipping down his arms. Draw the firing position fading. He looks at the woman. Her walk so proud, dressed in a sack with a simple waistband. He looks at the woman. She does not see him, walking forward to the latrine, her gaze fixed on the bird. Draw him looking at the woman, looking at the train of her walk, the ripples sent forth from her behind. There she has entered the latrine. He once again lifts his weapon, determined, indifferent to the ripples, to the ripples, indifferent to the train of her behind. Did you see? Once again, he prints, he presses his cheek. And although it is spring in the world, and perhaps because of the cold still, he closes one eye, watch, he aims, Concentrate, aims, and the bird, oh, the bird, hair exactly, and shoot. Did you draw it? Could you draw her sinking here, there, so close, right by her body like God landing softly, unheard? Begin with the woman. She hears a shot, one, and it's echoing, knocking at her temples, thundering to the ends of the forest and back. Was she hurt? Draw the sound, the bang, draw her, her anxiety, draw her leaving the latrine. She walks, there, she walks. She is unhurt, stands up, and fixes the stack on her body, straightens her back, looks, the bird is gone. She stands, she sends a worry look. What was the shot? She worries about her friends, stepping quickly into the barrack to arrive inside, to return. Begin with the woman. No, begin again with the officer. His gaze returns to the woman. He, she hurries her step, looking around frightened, anxious, her pace a near run. He still looks at her, amazed, bending down, spellbound, lifts the bird from the ground. She's twitching, her body still warm, feels her weight, how tiny she is and so pretty. Now he hands the bird to the woman. Now please draw the woman. Hurry. Now everything happens quickly. <coughs> he takes the bird as though it was planned, as though it was obvious, as though the bird was meant for her. She takes the bird in her hand without shaking, 
She takes the bird without so much as a look. She takes the bird, opens the barrack door, and enters, now running, breathless, to her friends, a little bird in her hand. The door is now open, and she sees they are not hurt. Now they are all inside. They worried about her. What was the shot? Now they are all inside, and the little bird dead. Now they are all inside, and the little bird held in her hand. Begin with the woman's friend. No, begin with the blockalteste. She is Czech, religious, short, hides her daughter in the little in a little cabin. She is good. Begin with the baking oven. No, begin with the bird. Begin with the pot. No, begin with the bird. Who plucked the feathers out? Why should the feathers be plucked? And what does the blockal test have to do with the bird? Begin from the beginning. Begin with the bird. Please draw me, draw for me a little bird. No, please draw for me a little pot. No, please draw for me a little oven. Look, inside the belly of the oven is a pot. And inside the belly of the pot, is a bird. Now you don't have, that you don't have to draw. Begin, begin with the woman's friend. No, begin with the woman. The woman is still shocked. The barrack door is closed. Her eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. She looks at her friends, holds the bird. No, begin with the woman's friend. She's older. No, not that old. She's still young, just a little bit more mature. She takes the bird from the woman's hands and walks over to the blockalteste. Watch her. How she grabs the little bird, elevating it ever so slightly and hinting to the little oven. Gently and the weight understanding elevates and hints to the little pot. She has time, elevates slowly and hints to the margarine. Lightly tilts her head to the right, elevates, pauses and hints to the flower. To the flower. She has patience for pepper and for salt. Look, now they are huddling a sweet secrecy. Draw the gaze. Draw the hunger. Draw the secret. Draw the agreement. Draw the hope. The hunger. Begin with the hunger. No. Begin with the bird. No. Begin with the woman. With the officer. The gun. With the with the barrack. With the, the oven. The pot. The bird. With the begin already. Come on. Begin. Begin with the memory. Begin with the the with the quiet, in silence, begin with muteness, begin with the silence, the silences. No, don't begin. Just be silent and don't begin and never say a thing. Don't write and don't draw a thing. Forget all that you've said and be silent. Erase all that you've written and be silent Erase and forget, forget and erase and be silent and let go of the barrack, let go of the officer, let go of the woman, let go of the hunger, let go of the gaze, let go of hope. Leave the silences, leave the voices and don't think oven or pot and don't touch story or song, expel the bird, God. Swallow the words and be silent. Forget, erase, and don't speak. And if you must, begin at least with noiseless in your head, in a whisper, whispering. Begin with the longing, the yearning. Do you know what Bechinalt is? Of course, you do. Begin with the Bechinalt. Draw its aroma rising spreading from the house, spreading through the house, rising from the pot, leaving the kitchen, 
crawling to the living room, reaching all the way to the carpet, to the radio, to the search for relative program, making the senses lose their mind, begin in the afternoon, draw the little apartment in give a time, the sun moves to a diagonal, and the light breeze comes from the sea. Begin with mother, begin with mother in the afternoon. Draw her cooking, a wooden spoon in hand, explaining to me about flour and how to make rocks. Begin with mother, afternoon. Draw her tall by the stove. Draw her closely, close. Draw her touching me. Begin with me. Begin with mother afternoon, draw her pretty on high hills. It's the hour of the day when sometimes, having stopped by the butchers and having bought some chicken, she would cook bachinard from a little bird that she got from an officer with the taste of much, so much, a very much time. The poem was translated by my son, Elazar Talrunen, and edited by Lynn Dyle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, it's a different thing in that meaning to ask questions. <laughs> For a uh, uh, for a poem and for a that kind that that's so personal thing, so I wouldn't say that's the questions, but perhaps some comment or some some thought or some impression, right? Uh, for uh, for the audience. But if not, I think it's absolutely understandable, so... Yes, yes, it's okay. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you very much for your, thank you very much for your lecture. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, uh, Ferenc Latsu, Latsu Ferenc, are you here? Latsu Feri, itt vagy? Nem, körülbelül egy hete megírtam neked, hogy beteg. Oh, yes, as I heard, now he is ill. Okay, he has written, but I was not sure that he remained ill up to now. Okay, in that case, I think uh, we are at the end of our uh, 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 program. Uh, so uh, now um, uh, we are at the end of the conference, and as I remember, uh, that will be the job of um, uh, uh, Stark Thomas to say some word as final words in this conference. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, hello, many thanks to the participants of the last panel. I hope that, uh, thank you for your generous contribution. I hope that we shall meet in person somewhere after the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, most uh, magyarul szeretnék köszönetet mondani mindazoknak, akik lehetővé tették ezt a konferenciát. Köszönetet szeretnék mondani a konferencia szervezőinek, uh, Kádár Zsuzsának, Virányi Péternek, uh, Nagy Péter Tibornak. Hát sokat dolgoztunk, különösen az utolsó két hétben. Uh, rövid leszek. Uh, én, és úgy gondolom, hogy még a konferenciával kapcsolatban még azért a jövőben is fogunk dolgozni, van teendő. 
ők köszönhet a szekcióvezetőknek, Kalmár Melindának, Tudipán Évának. Bocsánat, Tamás, úgy gondolod, hogy elmondod angolul is, vagy esetleg én írjam a csetbe szinkronfordítva? Hát nézd, én megpróbáltam elmondani angolul is. Uh, okay, uh, so first, so first um, you will hear uh, the sentence from Tomás in Hungarian, and after he will summarize it in English, okay? Jó, 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 ez így rendben van. Uh, a, a technikailag a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia Zoom rendszerét használtuk, tehát az akadémiának uh, kell ezt megköszönni, és a, hát én úgy érzékeltem, hogy tökéletesen működött ez a rendszer. Köszönet Vasko Editnek és Makra Mónikának, ők kezelték a rendszert, ők voltak a hoztok, tehát ők reggeltől estig itt voltak. A konferenciát a második világháború befejezésének 75. évfordulója alkalmából szerveztük, Keveset hallottunk idén az évfordulóról, több meghirdetett konferencia elmaradt, illetve eltolták jövő évre. A világpolitika se nagyon reagált az évfordulóra. Úgy tudom, Oroszországban volt egy látványos megemlékezés. A járvány elvonta a figyelmet az évfordulóról. Úgy gondoltuk, hogy azért meg kell tartani ezt a konferenciát akkor is, hogyha az online térbe szorulunk. Hát a konferencia technikai bravúr, és hát formálisan ez egy teljes értékű konferencia volt, de, 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 meg, de mégsem, mert hogy a konferenciához mindig hozzátartozik a személyes beszélgetés, a szünetekben való beszélgetés, mert fontos információ cserére, vagy ismerkedésre, akkor van lehetőség. És sajnos ez elmaradt, mert mert, mert ezt nem teszi lehetővé az a technika, ami, ami rendelkezésünkre áll. Tehát én úgy gondolom, hogy végül is a hagyományos konferenciát nem lehet ezzel kiváltani. A nyáron egy újságíró ismerősömmel beszélgettem, és azt kérdezte tőlem, hogy, hogy van még... Van-e még olyan dolog, amit még nem tudunk a második világháborúról? És hát nem olyan könnyű erre a tulajdonképpen teljesen jogos kérdésre válaszolni. De végül is ez a konferencia egy válasz erre a kérdésre, hisz voltak olyan előadások, amelyek új forrásokra épültek, például Barna Ildiko előadása, aki az International Tracing Service adathalmazát kutatta, és úgy foglalkozott az olaszországi zsidó dípikkel, vagy Márkus Beátának az előadása, ilyen volt a magyarországi németek elhurcolásáról, Priszpál előadását említem, Edmund Bézünmeyerről, Fórisákos előadását a magyar megszálló erőkről. Voltak olyan előadások, amelyek többé-kevésbé ismert forrásokat, tényeket használtak, ezekre épültek, de ezeket az félig meddig ismert tényeket teljesen új, szemlélettel közelítették meg, és új, izgalmas következtetésre jutottak. Milyen volt például Virányi Péter előadása arról, hogy hogyan vált Brandi a második birodalom. De hát ilyen volt a többi propagandával foglalkozó előadás is, a Andreas Gábor, Nagy Bogárka és a Daniela Oszácki előadása. De felmerültek új témák. Ilyen volt Nagy Péter Tibor előadása szerintem arról, hogy, hogy, hogy Budapesten élő zsidók túlélési esélyei milyenek voltak. Vitári Zsolt előadása, Németi fiúságról, Kalmár Miklós előadása, Náci elitről, Bene Krisztián előadása, Francia haderőről, de itt említhetem Egri Gábor és Lénárd András előbb hallott előadásait is. Aztán voltak olyan előadások, amelyek egy-egy ember sorsán mutatták be a korszakot mint Frank Tibor, Ullein Revicki Antal sorsán keresztül, Mezei Bálint, Végső, Végső István is egy-egy emberi sorsot mutatott be, de tulajdonképpen ide tartozik Martin Pérenbon professzor előadása. És hát egy külön kategóriába tartozik az utolsó előadás, amelyik, amelyik hát egy fantasztikus hangulati elem 
ezen a konferencián, és nagyon jó, hogy, hogy hát ezzel tudtuk befejezni. Említettem az újságíró ismerősömnek a kérdését, hogy van amit nem tudunk a másik világháborúról. Feltetett volna egy másik kérdés is, egy másik kérdést is, de azt nem, nem tette fel, hogy, hogy van-e értelme a második világháborúval kapcsolatos kutatásoknak. És hát ez is egy, egy, egy fontos kérdés, és nem könnyű válaszolni. De tegnap reggel a, a köszöntőjében Frank Tibor erre válaszolt, azt mondta, hogy a feledés nagy úr, az emlékezők eltűnnek, és marad a tudomány. 1945 a győzelem éve, és ez egy olyan világtörténelmi fordulat volt, nem is gondolunk rá, de meghatározzák az értékrendünket, gondolkodásunkat. A világháború a szabadság eszme győzelmét hozta, akkor is, hogyha ez a szabadság eszme ide a mi térségünkbe 1989-ben ért el. De ide tartozik két fontos, két fontos konvenció, az Emberi Jogok Egyetemes Nyilatkozata, ami ennek a háborúnak a következménye. És ugyanakkor született egy másik konvenció, a népírtás, büntet, a nép, a népírtás büntettének a a népétes büntettének a megelőzéséről. A győzelem következménye, mint ahogy Iványi Gábor mondta tegnap megnyitójában, az antifasiszta hagyomány. A történészeknek én szerintem az is feladata, hogy, hogy ezeket az említett értékeket megőrizzék, meg, meg hogyha meg, meg az is feladata, hogy lehetőségükhöz képest ellenálljanak annak, hogy visszazuhanjunk olyan korszakokba, amelyekre azt hittük, hogy már meghaladtuk. Említeni szeretném végezetül, hogy, hogy holnap még, még lesz konferencia, mely konferencia kifejezetten csak a második világháború története albizottsághoz kötődik, ez a konferencia lesz az emlékezés a pályatársakra, és itt, itt 16 olyan már nem köztünk lévő pályatársunkról fogunk beszélni, megemlékezni, akik jelentősen hozzájárultak ahhoz, hogy, hogy megismerjük a második világháborúnak a történetét. És ennek a konferenciának az elérhetőségét én most itt közzétettem a, a, a cseten, de hát persze elérhető ez sok helyen, többek között a Tudományos Akadémiának a honlapján. Ennyit szerettem volna végezetül mondani, és hát tudom, megpróbálom, megpróbálom nagyon röviden összefoglalni a, 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 a mondandómat. És I would like to summarize in English. What I said in Hungarian, uh, I mentioned that, uh, that during the summer I met a, a, a friend who is a journalist, and the, journal, and the journalist asked me, is there anything we do not know about the history of the Second World War? And uh, I was supposed to reply, but it was... It is not easy to, to, to reply to this question, but I think that this conference was really an answer to this question because we heard lectures uh, which were built on new sources, on new sources. Uh, we heard lectures uh, with, with, uh, with, new, with new consequences, lectures which were built with known sources and fact but uh, but the, but the outcome the consequence but the, the consequences were different uh, new topics showed up and we heard uh, lectures about the fate of of uh, personalities uh, famous personalities and personalities of about 
everyday persons, so-called everyday persons. But, but, but each personal fate reflected the atmosphere and the history of the Second World War. I, I mentioned that, uh, that the journalist uh, approached me that question, is there anything we do not know about the history of the Second World War? Uh, they did not ask another question, but there is another question here. Is there, is there any sense to deal with the history of the Second World War? And that's another important question, and it is not difficult to that question. But, uh, but, we, but, but we received a question uh, yesterday morning when uh, uh, Tibor uh, Frank, who, who introduced the whole conference, mentioned that that uh, the, the, the I, those generation which experienced the Second World War practically gone. And uh, it is the task of the, it is the task of the uh, so the, the 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 witnesses the witnesses of the of the war gone. But, but historians remained, we remained. And it is our task to speak about the Second World War. Uh, so we, we need to continue the work of the witnesses of the Second World War. Uh, 1945, this is the year of the victory. Uh, but it also means that, that, that this is, the, this is the, the victory of the, of the idea of freedom. And it, it, it was the victory of the idea of, free, of freedom, even though this idea reached this territory of this part of the world, I mean, East Central Europe, only in the late 80s, uh, after the fall of the communism. But it is important to emphasize, I think, that uh, 1945 was the year of the victory, which was the victory of, uh, of freedom, the idea of freedom. And here I, I had to mention uh, that uh, as a consequence of the victory, uh, Genocide Convention was born, 1948. And uh, another important convention was born uh, the same year in December 1948 on the civil rights, the Second World War and the victory uh, had a tremendous impact on, on our ideas, our views, our values, our morality. And uh, uh, Pastor uh, Ivani Gabor mentioned yesterday morning in his introduction that um, there is another heritage here, the heritage of anti-fascism. And I think that it is the task of the historian to, to preserve these values, to preserve these values. And uh, we have to do everything uh, to, to avoid that, 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 that we should return to era. Uh, we, we, we already passed. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. And I would like to ask uh, my Peter Tibor to, to correct me or to add something if I was, if I was wrong or if, if I was not correct. Uh, so please, Peter, do you have any uh, comment? I think you were absolutely correct. Uh, um, Perhaps uh, that uh, the that was some uh, element uh, 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 about the memory of forty five in this year. So it was not so catastrophic. So it was not an absolute uh, success of the coronavirus. So there was some element, but I think uh, it's true that uh, this conference was the uh, most wide and most important. Uh, 
uh, especially in this country. I mean, that's yeah. that's my only 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 comment. And I think it was a a very 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 successful and a very very good uh, uh, conference. In the last uh, weeks, I I was not the member of the organizing committee, so I don't. Um, um, say good about myself but i say good uh, about your work so in 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 this meaning uh, i i say thank you for the organizers so uh, thank you thank you very much and finally i would like to emphasize that uh, emphasize that formally it was a perfect conference technically it was perfect but uh, but i like the personality i like the opportunity to meet each other in person. And I hope that next time we shall meet somewhere in Hungary or outside Hungary. So thank you very much for your attention and see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.